Another excursion into integrity and broadcasting. Open up the door. Starts right now. So fling wide, you heavenly gates. Prepare the way of the risen Lord. The Apostle John was on the island of Patmos. He was in prison for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And he heard a sound behind him. He said, Behold, I looked. There was a door standing open in heaven. And I heard a voice which was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here. I will show you the things which must take place. That's what we need, my friends. We need a heavenly perspective of the things that are going on in the world around us. The things that the Word of God foretold us would come to pass. Those things which must take place. Those things which are taking place even now. That is what this broadcast is all about. Discussing the issues of the day. Discerning the times in which we live. From a biblical perspective and world view. Good day everybody. Andy White here. What you are about to hear is the fusion of heart, mind, and soul. I want to welcome everybody from all across the fruited plain, of course, and all around. You know what it is. The spherical globe spinning on its axis, going around its orbit, around the sun. But I digress. But thanks for tuning in to this week's edition of Open Up the Doors, and I am all fired up and ready to go. But I am also streaming live over on my Facebook page. If you want to join in the conversation over there, do a great big meet and greet over at facebook.com slash faithfm91.7. Let us know where you are watching from, and also shoot me some comments and uh, other uh, things you'd maybe like for me to uh, observe on the stream or share your thoughts, if you will, on the stream there. Uh, if you're outside of the Faith FM broadcast area, the best way to listen to Faith FM is to download the free Faith FM app, which we have both for the uh, Android platforms and the Apple platforms. Look at your respective uh, app supplier for those. Look up Faith FM in Sag Harbor. Also, you can follow me on Truth Social Network at AJ White. Uh, the networking there, the fellowshipping there is 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 growing. I'm 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 happy about that. It's just another means, just another means to network and reach out with the message and the gospel and the hope of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about, uh, in my playbook anyway. So anyway, I think those get, that kind of deals with most of the preliminaries that I want to deal with because I want to get to what I need to get to. I will be planning on going to the phones in the second hour. Write down the phone number. It's first come, first serve, 631-725-2069. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the second hour on the t- today's subject or on any subject you'd like to uh, throw my way. And if you throw me any curveballs, I'll swing at it anyway. All righty. All right, so today let's get on with what's on the agenda for today. Today in Israel is the Jewish Memorial Commemorative Day known as Tisha B'Av. I can't believe it's actually today for this broadcast. Um, It actually began last night like all Jewish uh, holidays, not that this is a holiday per se, it's a, it's a memorial day, but all the Jewish day always begins uh, at, at sundown, uh, roughly 6 p.m. The, the night before until 6 p.m. the following day. So their day actually started yet Wednesday evening, but today it's Thursday during the day, and it's, it's still the day there in, in Israel, Tisha B'Av. In the Hebrew year of 5783, I'm saying that on purpose because that's the time date. That's a time stamp for this broadcast because I've talked about Tisha B'Av several times over the course of the last nine years. But because it is Tisha B'Av, it's always a great opportunity to speak about what's going on in Israel. And uh, especially since so many so, so much serious stuff has been going on there in Israel and it's often many times you've heard me say it many times it's been often said that 
as regards the last days and the return of the Lord, that Israel is God's timepiece. If you want to know what time it is on God's prophetic time schedule, just keep your eye on Israel. If I said it once, I've said it a thousand times. Israel is ground zero for all prophetic fulfillment. All prophetic roads lead to Israel. And what is unfolding in Israel right now should catch the attention of all believers everywhere. Because what happens in Israel is God's canary in the coal mine, so to speak. But before I get into those reports and the, and, 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 and the specifics of that and the seriousness of the political situation that has been unfolding in Israel the last several weeks, I want to take note and point out the curious timing of it all. Tick-tock, tick-tock, for the clock is ticking. And as I said a moment ago, throughout the course of the years on this broadcast, I have spoken and taught about this day known as Tisha B'Rab, the ninth of Av. That's what Tisha B'Rab means, it's simply the ninth of the Hebrew month, the Jewish month of Av. I've done it several times, so I'm not going to reiterate everything that I've, that's involved with the complete historical record of Tisha B'Rab, because I've done it many times before. Look those broadcasts up in my archives but for those who may be new to the broadcast and to set up for today's discussion for those who may not be familiar with this day on the jewish calendar i will give a brief review and synopsis of what tisha bara is and uh again if you want a, a fuller and a very interesting by the way a very interesting full of historical accounting of all the things that have occurred on tisha bara again simply do a search for tisha bara on my on my uh, archives on Rumble and on YouTube. But the bottom line is this. Bad things always seem to happen to the Jews and to Israel on the 9th of Av. It is a day of historical significance throughout Jewish history. It is a day of infamy. And I personally believe it certainly will have further prophetic significance in our days as well because the precedents have already been established. And God is a God of prophetic patterns. Tisha B'Rav is regarded as the saddest day on the Jewish calendar. And it is believed by many Orthodox Jews to be a day which is destined for tragedy. Jewish tradition, to get into a little bit, again, this is just the foundation of what Tisha B'Rav is all about. Jewish tradition holds that it was the day the ten Jewish spies brought back to Moses the bad report concerning the promised land, which then resulted in Israel's 40 years of wandering. Now that's based on tradition, and it, that may or may not be true. But when you consider the time indicators in Numbers 13, it is clearly a possibility. When I, when I read that about the, the Jewish tradition, I went back into Numbers, and I, and I, I kind of looked at what the time stamps were. And it, 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 does, it does fit. It can fit. But anyway, on a much more definitive and empirical historical basis, the day, this day of fasting and mourning primarily commemorates the destruction of both the first temple, Solomon's temple, which was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C., and the second temple in Jerusalem, which was destroyed by the Romans in A. 70 on the same exact day the ninth of Av 655 years apart but both temples were destroyed and decimated on the ninth of Av strange coincidence is it not no 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 God doesn't do anything coincidentally but the but the history of Tisha B'Rab doesn't end there and I'm just going to just going to give you a, a, few, a few smatterings. There's much more, but these are some important ones. On August 4th in 135 A.D., that was Tisha B'Rab that year, the Romans under Hadrian crushed the Jewish rebellion for independence that was led by Simon Bar Kokhba, which was the, who was declared to be the Messiah by an influential, an influential rabbi, excuse me, named Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva had identified Simon Bar Kosiba, that was his real name, Kosiba, but 
Akiva renamed him Bar Kokhba, a play on a play on words, a play on 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 Simon Bokisaba's name. But Rabbi Akiva proclaimed and declared declared that Simon Bar Kosiba as the Messiah. And again, he gave him the the name Bar Kokhba, meaning son of the star in the Aramaic language. And Akiva took that from the star prophecy in Numbers 24, where the prophecy of the Messiah is laid out. There shall come a star out of Jacob. Now, we know that's Jesus, but they had rejected Jesus. This is 135 A.D. This is another almost uh, whatever it is, uh, almost another 70 years past the first destruction of the temple. Now there's another Jewish war. I don't want to get into all the history of that. But Simon Bar Kokhba had also taken upon himself the title of Nasi Israel, Prince of Israel. And Bar Kokhba ruled over an entity that was virtually a little independent state for two and a half years in Israel. Now, I happen to believe personally that this is what Jesus prophesied about when he said, I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Man, the whole, the whole story, the whole episode of Simon Bar Kokhba and, and Rabbi Akiva fits this to a T. But cutting to the quick, during that, during that, that, that Roman Jewish war, the Romans killed 580,000 Jews. And here's the catch. According to Jewish history, the fortress in Bata, which was that little, that, that conclave, I shouldn't say little, it was a city, it was a fortress. That's where, where uh, Bar Kokhba was, really had set up his independent Jewish state. But the, but, but the, the Romans breached uh, the fortress in Bata and destroyed it. You know what day it was? How many want to, how many want to posit a guess? Yes, it was the ninth of Av. Historical records, Tisha B'Rav. And furthermore, in disgust and rage of the Jews, the Emperor Hadrian plowed the entire city of Jerusalem. This was the final purging. This was the beginning, the real beginning. A lot of people date stuff back to 70 AD, but the real final purging and leveling and dispersion and the uh, diaspora began really in 135 AD because Hadrian was so enraged with the with the Jews and their rebellion and their and, and their and, and their war that he plowed the entire city of Jerusalem thus fulfilling the prophet Micah literally Pro Micah 3 verses 12 uh, chapter 3 verse 12 says therefore because of you and when you look up the context of Micah chapter 3 the the you be therefore because of you it's all of the the corrupt political and spiritual leaders of Israel therefore because of you Zion shall be plowed like a field Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the temple like the bare hills of the forest the Emperor Hadrian I seriously doubt had any knowledge of this Jewish prophecy, but he fulfilled it to the T. The Romans that crushed Bar Kokhba's revolt and destroyed the city of Bata, killing over 500,000 Jewish civilians, uh, civilians, then completely destroyed Jerusalem, ran plows over the city, and the surviving Jews were expelled and were banned from returning to Jerusalem. So you could say, by way of the calendar, that the Jewish diaspora began on Tisha B'Rav 2,000 years ago. In the aftermath of leveling the city, Hadrian ordered the city, as I said, to be plowed over, and he rebuilt it as a Roman city. A temple to Jupiter was erected on the site of Solomon's temple. And a statue to Hadrian was erected on the, spite, on the spot that had been occupied by the Holy of Holies. Folks, if this wasn't a foreshadowing of the time of Jacob's trouble, then I don't know what is. This is, this is so pregnant with typology and, and shadow fulfillments of what Jesus talked about in the Olivet Discourse. 
After the Romans rebuilt the city of Jerusalem, it was renamed Aelia Capitolina. Aelia was Hadrian's middle name. Capitolina was the, was the, was the name of the pagan god, really Capitoline Jupiter in, in, in Roman culture. The Jews, now listen to this, the Jews were forbidden into this new city. They were forbidden to enter into Jerusalem. And any Jew caught trying to enter was crucif crucified immediately. There was only one exception made. This was, called, this was called rubbing the salt in the wounds. The only time that Jews were allowed to enter into the city and to pray, according to Roman edict, after 135 A.D., was on the 9th of Av, Tisha B'Rav. On Tisha B'Rav each year, for a fee, a Jew could enter the city and pray for the restoration of the temple. So then, there's so much more. I just touched upon it by way of review. Both temples were destroyed on the 9th of Av. The 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And then the 2,000 year exile of the Jews all began on Tisha B'Rav. The 9th of Av. That's today. Is all this merely some cosmic coincidence? I think not, brothers and sisters. But let me note one more cosmic coincidence. And I use the term tongue-in-cheek, of course, before I take a break and get, on t get into some of the present-day news. On August 2nd, 1941, you guessed it, it was Tisha B'Rav. August 2nd, 1941. SS commander Heinrich Himmler formally received the approval from the Nazi party for the edict known as the Final Solution. You've all heard of that. The Final Solution. The edict given by the Nazis to eradicate their Jewish problem. That edict was given on the 9th of Av. Were they aware of that? I don't know. I don't know if they were aware of it or not. Whether they were aware of it or not is almost immaterial. But as a result, the Holocaust began, during which almost two-thirds of the world's Jewish population perished, and you could date it to the 9th of Av. Tisha B'Rav. That's today's date on our, on our calendar in our year of 2023. July 27th. What could be happening in Israel today? And, and let me be clear about something. It's not to say that every single year on Tisha B'Rav, every single year something terrible happens. I'm not saying that. I don't want to give that impression. But when you look at the historical record over several thousand years, the most significant, the most unbelievable occurrences have happened on Tisha B'Rav. Tisha B'Rav, it's like a prophetic ticking time bomb. And sadly, I can assure you, brothers and sisters, I can assure you, there is more, much more to come. Because the, the clock is ticking down. I'll be back in a moment. And we'll continue with this discussion. I just wanted to lay out the background for today's comments. Stick around, I'll be right back. Welcome back. That's a tune called What is the Question? Andy White here on the radio, tearing down strongholds. You are listening to Open Up the Doors, Integrity in Broadcasting. If you're just tuning in here on Faith FM, WEGB 90.7 and 93.3 in that peak, WEGQ 91.7 in Quag. And speaking of what is the question, someone had a question that I don't know the answer to. I hope, I'm hoping they look it up. But someone had a question. On, on the Facebook stream asking 
Isn't the next Tisha B'Av on Monday, August 12th, 2024? That would be next year. I don't know. It would be easy to find out. You can just Google it. They, they give you, if you go to, you know, you just, just Google Tisha B'Av, they'll give you all the dates that it falls on, both in the past and for the foreseeable future as well. But I'm curious. I'm going to ask a question, an answer to a question. Why did you ask if it was August 12th next year? Is August 12th something... Um, I asked Siri, LOL. Well, I don't know. Is it? But, okay. I'm, I'm conversing with this person on, on Facebook right now. <laughs> they asked Siri when it was. Um, well, is it August 12th? And if it is, why did you ask if it was a... Is there something about August 12th that is curious? I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'd be curious to find out why you asked about the date for next year. It, it, get back to me. Get back to me about... Uh, um, what your answer is with that? Just confused about the date. She said, "Well, uh, um, you got to recognize, of course, and I'm sure you, I'm sure you are aware of this, like that the Jewish calendar always moves around. They have a, lo- a lunar based calendar as opposed to our solar based calendar, so the dates are are always moving. Of course, it's 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 the same day on their calendar, the ninth of Av, but the Gregorian calendar date would would be different." All right, so let's get back to what's going on in Israel right now on this Tisha B'Av. I don't know how many people have noticed or taken note, but there have been protests going on all over the place, all over the country for several weeks now. Demonstrators in Israel have been blocking roads and declaring that they're not going anywhere. And um, and even more concerning about everything that's going on right now in Israel is that thousands of reserve soldiers are refusing to report for duty and hundreds of reserve Air Force pilots are going on strike in all of these protests. And obviously that could put, that could put Israel, obviously, I think it should be noted that that in a very bad national security situation, should its enemies like Hezbollah or Hamas or Islamic Jihad or the Iranians directly, should, could they be tempted to exploit Israel's weakened condition and exploit the, 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 the situation right now? It's a possibility. I don't know. I'm kind of I'm kind of fifty fifty on it. Sometimes you know your enemies say, well, if your if your enemy is 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 shooting himself, and if your enemy is fighting amongst themselves, step aside and let your enemy do it. So there's that there's that thinking in my mind. But I don't know. These people are are so demonically um, hateful of of the nation of Israel that maybe maybe it's sixty forty chance maybe it's not fifty fifty maybe it's a sixty forty chance that they will seek to exploit the situation. Many are saying uh all over both both uh in Israeli politics and uh around the world uh, here in America, many are saying that this has been the most fragile period in israel's seventy five years of existence. Why what is causing this political and societal upheaval. Well, last Sunday, the Netanyahu administration passed a law that took away the Supreme Court of Israel's authority to override laws that they felt were, quote-unquote, unreasonable. And the Knesset plans to pass another law where a simple majority of the Knesset, that's their, that's their Congress, so to speak, that's their parliament, they're planning to pass another law, which I don't believe has been voted on yet, uh, where only a simple majority, 51% of the Knesset, could override the Supreme Court decisions to overturn laws they pass. Now, the left in Israel is up in arms. It's the left that's causing most of the the instigation, just like they do here, um, they're they're mis they're they're they're. It's a complicated situation to say the least. Israeli politics are complicated to say the least. But to boil it down, what's really going on is a basic power struggle between a conservative government in the Netanyahu government 
and an ultra-liberal court. The Supreme Court in Israel is ultra, ultra-liberal, and there's some other problems with it, too. The whole, the whole point that Netanyahu wanted to bring and the Likud party wanted to bring forth the, these, uh, these changes, they're calling it judicial reformation, is because, quite frankly, their court system really does need reformation. It's 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 a it's it's just a, a liberal leftist cabal that crushes anything uh, the legislature does that it finds here's the word unreasonable. So again, we're having this power struggle that's really dividing, uh, in a spiritual sense, the things that are going on in Israel. Are very very uh, they mirror what's going on here in America. But here here's the irony of the situation. Ironically, the Supreme Court in Israel can override this new law by using the very law that they're seeking to take away. <laughs> it's like a catch-22 here. Such a move would lead to... Now, here's the funny part. Some people are saying that Israel is undergoing a constitutional crisis. But uh, the problem is, is that calling it a constitutional crisis isn't really a good and proper explanation because Israel... Here's the problem. Israel doesn't have a constitution. So it's a real power struggle between separate branches of government where there's really no balance of power constitutionally. So many people are saying this, this could lead possibly, and we pray it doesn't, because there's a lot, of, a lot of serious and dangerous consequences for this. But this is, everyone's worried, and rightfully so, that civil war, a civil war could break out in Israel. So let me give you a little bit more background. And again, I want to say clearly, I am not by any stretch of the imagination an expert on Israeli politics. <laughs> not even close. Actually, I'm not so sure the Israelis are experts on their politics. <laughs> I'm just joking. But you now it's a weird system over there. But in Israel, the Supreme Court has tremendous power. Unlike our uh, Supreme Court of the United States, the Israeli court is self-appointed and it's self-perpetuating. In other words, it's not that the prime minister can appoint and nominate judges like in our system. The president uh, appoints judges and they have to go before Congress to be approved. Ain't nothing like that in Israel. In Israel, the Supreme Court picks the people that they want. They pick the judges they want. So you can begin to see the problem already. When you've got an overwhelmingly leftist cabal of people, they're only going to pick the ones that they want. So they self-perpetuate their own power. They self-perpetuate their own, their own. Uh, well, I guess power is the best way to put it. And since, again, they are, since they're largely a left-leaning liberal court, and because Israel has no constitution, so then how does, how does the court then make decisions? See, again, in our courts, we have laws laws that are made by the legislature and they do in israel too but in our court system because we have the law of the land is called the constitution and not the separate bodies the 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 supreme court of the united states looks to the constitution there's that arbiter there's that 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 um well again the best word to use that that's the arbiter in a way the Constitution. The, 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 the Supreme Court will look at the Constitution and say, you know what, that law that's passed by Congress, well, that is constitutional. Or, conversely, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope. we're going to have to strike that law down because it's against the Constitution. They don't have that in Israel. So they came up with this criteria called, quote-unquote, reasonableness. Oh, yeah, this is a talk about a moving target. So then, if the court deems a law, quote-unquote, unreasonable, it throws it out. Okay, you could, I hope you begin to see the problem here. This is why Netanyahu said, no, we've got to change this. Just when you've got a bunch of leftist liberals, Marxist communists calling everything that we want to implement in the Knesset unreasonable, well, that's unreasonable. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but it's not funny. It's a problem. Because, of course, in their liberal minds, in their liberal worldview and positions, uh, they believe that what they decide is reasonable. And, of course, conservative ideas and policies, they're not reasonable. So they just throw them out. So the result is that elected officials in the legislature can vote and say 
uh, we're going to legislate this new law, and the Israeli Supreme Court can just capriciously say, nope, nope, nope. We find it to be unreasonable. Not unconstitutional, but unreasonable because they don't have a constitution. And they strike it down. So that's probably a really oversimplified, but from all my research and all my looking into the situation, I, 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 I think the way I laid it out is pretty pretty close to the issue. So again, the division in Israel is very much like it is here in the U- U.S. with the culture clash being between the left and the right, the liberals and the conservatives. And the liberals in Israel don't want the court reformed. Uh, reformed. Think about this. It's almost like a mirror image. The liberals in Israel don't want the court reformed because they like what the court does. In this country, you know, that there's been a movement to reform our court because liberals don't like the conservative court. So again, it's the same kind of a zeitgeist happening between the left and the right. And tying that in, well, let me give let me give you a little quote here from from uh, from Reuters regarding the situation in Jerusalem. This is from from a Reuters report yesterday. Just a little clip. The uh, Israel Supreme Court said on Wednesday yesterday it would hear an appeal against a new law that curbs some of its own powers, pitting it against Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's right wing government that is seeking an overhaul of the judicial system. Essentially, what I just said. The court yesterday yesterday said a bench decision posted on the court's website said that a hearing will be set for the appeal, those who want it to be struck down, in September. I'm surprised they're even doing that. That's actually a good sign in some ways, but they're basically kicking the can down the road. So this is going to go on for, for another month or so. Because the court did not issue an injunction against the new law. That That's somewhat surprising. The court did not issue an injunction against the new law, which came into effect on Wednesday, which is yesterday. Judicial overhaul opponents see parallels. Here's where I want to connect the dots. The judicial overhaul opponents see parallels to Tisha B'Av, which is the saddest day in the Hebrew year. I'm reading out of, out of the... Uh, out of an Israeli news report here. There's been images. Oh, I got this from the Times of Israel. I'm going to post this on my Open Up the Doors page. This was a really, really good article in the Times of Israel. I've read a few, but this one was the most fair and balanced. Most of the other articles were very leftist. This one is is really, I think, middle of the road, just laying out the facts here, the Times of Israel. But the Times of Israel did a report on how uh, there's been an image going around... Uh, social media in, 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 in Israel, and the image uh, says in Hebrew, Shisha Barav, which is the sixth of the month of Av, and saying that, because that was the date, the sixth of Israel, the sixth of Av was when they passed this legislation. But they're connecting Shisha Barav, the sixth, to the ninth of Barav, saying that, you know, it's kind of a play on, on things, and the picture shows the destruction of the temples and flames and everything. So the image started circulating almost as soon as the government finished voting to approve a divisive piece of legislation this week. Shisha Barab, it said in white Hebrew letters against a black background, the sixth of Ab, as I just said. That was the Hebrew date on Monday. I said that. I'm going to move on. I got I want to get, get cut to the quick here. The image is going around. But the point is this. For the sake of time, let me, let me, let me shrink this down, make it more concise. I'm going to post it on, on Facebook. The bottom line is this. No one is missing the symbolism on the left, said David Sellis, a graduate student at New York Yeshiva University, who was researching the use of Jewish text and images in the protest over time. No one is missing the symbolism on the left. In the hours after the Knesset vote, he tweeted out a suggestion to read the Book of Lamentations, which is what they do read during Tisha B'Av, but to read it out in front of the Israeli consulate when, the, when Tisha B'Av began on Wednesday night. Others also suggesting, others also suggested turning Tisha B'Av into a focal point for Jews, mourning what they see as a catastrophic development in politics. 
Jewish leaders in Israel and the United States are invoking the fast day in their statements. Rabbis are planning to speak out about Israel at their congregation services, and special events are being held to observe the day of mourning in public ways. This groundswell of attention, some say, could make Tisha B'Av a newly relevant to non-Orthodox American Jews and secular Israelis who have been historically been less likely to observe its, its, its rituals. I think that's a good thing because, again, I think it's God's prophetic time clock, and he's shaking, the, he's shaking everyone, especially at ground zero in, in Israel, to say, my prophetic clock is moving forward. And uh, one pundit said this, Tisha B'Av, the day when we marked the loss of our sovereignty 2,000 years ago due to internal fighting, said Julie Platt, chair of the Jewish Foundation, uh, Federations of North America. She said that uh, the parallels to today are frightening. Another uh, person, y- y- Yadidia Stern, president of the Jewish People Policy Institute, said this, I see radicalization right now on the street, and I really hope will be able to contain it. Let's hope Tisha B'Av will only be a memory and not a reality for us. So there it is, folks. There is a potential, there's talk of a potential civil war. And it's a critical time on this Tisha B'Av for Israel right now. There's no balance of power and it's a very volatile situation. And it's really all very interesting that this situation is happening in Israel during the days and on the day of Tisha B'Av, to say the least. Folks, it's not political. It's spiritual. All of it is God's prophetic timing. I'll be back. Fusion of heart, mind, and soul. This is Open Up the Doors with Andy White here on Faith FM, WEGB 90.7 and 93.3 in that peak. WEGQ 91.7 in Quag. Jumping right on it, getting back in. I got a few minutes left. I want to close out this first hour with some some kind of putting a little bow on that on that uh, stuff I was dealing with in the beginning of the broadcast because I want to change gears in the second hour. But that just by way of some broadcast memos here. Uh, the first hour of this broadcast re-airs today, Thursday at 3 p.m., and also re-airs at 1 p.m. on Saturday. If you, if you missed any part of it and you'd like to tune back in, that would be great here on Faith FM. Also, if you'd like to, if you missed it you, and you can't get back to the radio, of course, we, we post these broadcasts both on my YouTube channel and my Rumble channel as well. So please subscribe. Uh, you can find me on YouTube at uh, Andy White, Open Up the Doors. Subscribe, hit the little bell there, and you'll get notifications when we do upload these archived broadcasts. I'm also on Rumble, same thing, AJ White 777 or open up the doors, do a search there on Rumble. It's kind of my main uh, video hosting platform because they don't censor me there, and they, they keep all my my videos up, whereas the, the YouTube channel, I've got several that are missing because they banned them. But anyway, let me, uh, let me move on with this. Speaking of Truth Social, oh, well, I wasn't actually, I was speaking of Rumble, but speaking of Truth Social, um, I do have an open up the doors group page on social so if you are over there on the social platform and you're following me please join in the group page the group pages is, is really centered around all that i do on this broadcast as well um just looking at the the, the, the cultural issues the spiritual issues of our day from a biblical worldview and keeping p- folks uh, building up a network and keeping folks connected with what is going on in in a prophetic sense, these these eschatological times that we live in. By way of a really quick announcement, too, for anyone who might be interested in the Riverhead area, we are going out tomorrow night, Friday night, for street evangelism for the Alive on 25 uh, festival that's going on over there on Main Street in Riverhead. I'll be going out with the team like we have been. I know some people have been asking about it. We will be meeting at 6 p.m. That The, the uh, festival goes from 6 to 9, and we'll be going out just to hand out tracts and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people there on Main Street in Riverhead. Uh, look for the Ask Me About Jesus sign. You can't miss it. 
Walk down the street. You'll find us if you'd like to join in with us. All right, I will be going to the phones as well in the second hour. The number is 631-725-2069, 631-725-2069. All right, I got a few minutes. I rushed through that because there's some here that some things here I do want to, 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 to uh, tidy up before I get into the second hour. So many times you've heard me say, I'm going to say, I, I think I said it in the, in the first block of this broadcast, all prophetic roads lead to Israel. All prophetic roads lead to Jerusalem. Israel is ultimately ground zero for all the prophetic end time scriptures. It is the center of gravity for all the end time events. So we need to keep our eyes on Israel. It is, it is God's prophetic timepiece whatever issue whatever facet of eschatology you want to discuss whatever is going on geopolitically in the world i don't care if it's in timbuktu ultimately it leads back to jerusalem and israel trust me on that it's god's timepiece as i said israel is the final geopolitical judgment seat of god almighty for all the nations of the world and my friends the clock is ticking down the prophet Joel said, for behold, in those days and at that time, God's got an appointed time and the clock is ticking towards it. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah in Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and I will enter into judgment with them there. Why? On account of my people, my heritage, Israel. We could just preach on that for another hour, but I have to move on. You see, when we begin to see and consider the big, the big picture of the end time scenario that is laid out in the scriptures, the whole of it, we see that Satan, Satan, who is the ultimate spiritual force behind the Antichrist himself and the Antichrist kingdom of the beast, Satan has always hated and warred against the Jewish people. Anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism. I'm telling you, I know I'm going to upset some, some people there, but it's demonic. Always was, always will be. It's demonic because Satan hates God and God's people and the nation that God chose. Satan hates Israel as a nation. Why? I just said it because God established Israel as a nation and from that nation would come the one who would crush the serpent's head, the Messiah. We read in Revelation 12 verses 12 through 13, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. That's the third woe in Revelation, by the way. I won't get into all that. In, in Revelation chapter 10, it talks about three woes or chapter 11. I forgot which one, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. Why has the devil come down? Because Satan, because I'm sorry, Michael threw him out. If you go back and read Revelation 12, verse 1, and war broke out in heaven, and Satan, and, and, and Michael and, the, and, and, and his angels fought with the devil and his angels, and they're thrown out of heaven. Go back and read the whole chapter. This is a pivotal chapter. This is not something that happened in the distant past. This is something that's going to happen in the middle of the tribulation especially in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the context of the book of Revelation, right in, smack in the middle. But yes, my friends, he knows that the time is short. The clock is ticking down. The clock is running out on the devil. The time is coming when his time is up. But in the meantime, now when the dragon saw that he'd been cast down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. That's Israel. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with her and the rest of her offspring. Who would that be? Us, the Christians. How do I know that? Because it's the very next part of the sentence. The rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
folks, Satan hates both Israel and the church because Israel and the church are have a they have a they have a, a destiny. They have a destiny. They're connected at the hip. Better still, they're connected in the olive branch and the olive tree, I should say. Satan is enraged with both Jews and Christians because we're the ones opposing him. The devil is waging war with great wrath against both Israel and the true church of Jesus Christ. Against those who I'll say it again, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The devil isn't enraged with the apostate church. His wrath isn't targeted against the Jezebelian compromised church. His hatred is focused against those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now you may ask then why is unbelieving Israel and Jews included in that? Because Satan hates what God loves and Satan wants to destroy what God wants to restore. Selah. I'll say that again. Satan wants to destroy what God wants to restore and the deliverance and the restoration of natural Israel will come about in due time. Satan hates Jerusalem and he wants to put his throne there and that's exactly what the Antichrist will do when he rises to power. The fall of Satan is the rise of the Antichrist. I, I'm running out of time. I can't get into all the particulars of that. But I firmly believe that when, 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 when the Bible says that Satan was thrown out from heaven in, 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 in Revelation 12, you see the very next chapter, chapter 13, is where you see the rise of the Antichrist and the rise of the beast system. I believe that's the moment when Satan is thrown out of, the, uh, of heaven. That I believe that's the moment he literally uh, possesses the man who is known as the, the, the Antichrist, the man who is the son of perdition. The mystery of iniquity will be completed in those days. Satan manifested in the flesh. You know, Paul tells us that great, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. Well, conversely, the mystery of iniquity, iniquity will be Satan manifested in in the flesh in second Thessalonians chapter 2 for we for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way and then the lawless one will be revealed I can't get into all of the scripture there because I'm out of time just about but again my friends all of history all of the current geopolitics and the movements of the nations are all marching forward to that glorious moment of the return of Jesus Christ yes my friends yes the clock is ticking. Time is ticking. OA. We're on the verge. God's prophetic time clock is ticking away. And the time is short. And I'm out of time for this first hour. But I will return. Keep it right here on Faith FM. In the meantime, watch, stand fast in the faith. Be brave, be strong. And let all that you do be done in love, beloved. Keep it right here on Faith FM.